So really quick heads up, I apologize about this video just being audio and gameplay. I actually set up with Tommy before we started the interview. I opened up Skype. I checked the recording software. I did a test before we actually started doing the interview. Everything seemed great. Press the record button and it didn't record my side of the video were on my webcam there was nothing there it was black and tommy's side was very choppy and the audio was completely out of sync from his video feed so it was completely worthless luckily i had a backup of the audio being recorded so the audio was perfect and could be salvaged but yeah that's why you're just seeing gameplay and just hearing our voices i do apologize about that but enjoy the killing floor 2 and dying like gameplay links below in the description if you want to pick either game up Enjoy the video. This video is being brought to you by Cutting Edge Gamer. If you upgrade graphics cards often, Cutting Edge Gamer is the perfect option for you. Lease the newest graphics cards on the market, such as NVIDIA's RTX 20 series, for a low monthly payment. Click the affiliate link below in the description to find out more. Skip it up and that up. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Rich of Review Tech USA, and I have a very special guest, which saw my Intellivision Amico video. It is actually now the president of Intellivision, Tommy Tellerico, who I have known about since the G4 days when he had a show on. G4. Oh boy! Yeah, I remember watching you back on there. What do you What are you watching that crappy network for? What was wrong with you? Oh, but that was that was before YouTube, man. <laughs> that was the pre that was the pre YouTube days with uh, Victor Lucas. That's right. That's all we had. Me and Vic. That's all we had. X Play and Adam Sessler, and yeah, that's that's all we had back then, isn't it? I remember even before <laughs> that going up before they merged and had that fatal merger, which ended up killing both of them, in my opinion. But that's for a different video. Uh, I agree. When they were Tech TV, and they had the screensavers and Call for Help and that's Leo right. Laporte and all that, man. Leo we're going. Yeah, we're going way yeah. back. But, and uh, it, it's interesting because me and Vic were doing the show way before G4. We, we actually started it in 1995 is when we were first on air. So that was a good, you know, I think six or seven years before uh, G4 uh, was, a, was a thing. So, yeah, Vic, uh, and it was really Vic's whole concept and, and idea. Um, you know, I helped move it along, but, but Vic was the, uh, you know, Vic was the, uh, the visionary there. And, uh, and people thought we were nuts, you know? People were like, who would watch content, TV shows, and information about video games? Like, who cares, you know? Uh, so that was, you know, that was 20, what? Geez, almost 25, 23 years ago. And now, you know, there's tens of millions of people every day <laughs> on Twitch and YouTube creating it's, amazing it, content. It mo it's, almost, it's almost pretty much a mo not even the games industry aside put that, but I'm talking about the content that people create based around it in and of itself right. is a multi-million, quite possibly a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, and it's a yeah, big, well, who the hell would have saw that coming back even 20 years ago? That's right. And I, and I always say on stage when I do my video games live shows, I always say that, you know, people, you know, some some people who don't understand the video game industry, they always talk about, you know, all oh, games are bad or, you know, get out of your mom's basement or, you know, they cause violence. But what I always say is that video games no uh, think about this. No other medium in the history of the universe has inspired more people to create things. Right. I mean, whether it's a cosplayer creating these artistic costumes that they spend months on or you go to a website like ocremix.org where, you know, people are or, or some of these video game cover bands or you go to, you know, conferences like MAGFest where it's all video game music cover bands, people doing music from around the world, creating th things based on video games. Go to go to like uh um, you know, uh, deviantart.com and put in Mario or Final Fantasy or Zelda, you'll get hundreds of thousands of people inspired by video games to create art. And then, of course, there's folks like yourself, there's folks on YouTube, there's folks on Twitch TV, tens of millions of people every day inspired to create content and to be creative because of video games. You name anything else in the world, maybe religion, uh, but, but where, where tens of millions of people are creating artistic things 
because they're inspired. So I did a whole TED talk on this as well. That was my whole, the whole thesis of my TED talk was how video games are art in disguise and how they inspire people. They don't, you know, put uh, controllers in people's hands and go kill people. You know, it's, it's crazy. Well, I think the reason why there's been such a stigma to video games too, I know we're totally off topic guys, but it's still uh, something yeah, yeah, interesting well, to talk well, about, which is fine, yeah. is before, I think my, I, I'm, an 80s baby i was born 81 my generation was the first one to grow up from birth with video games and and before that it was more so like a gimmicky for people thought it was going to be an AOA. i should say a gimmicky curiosity like i remember even my dad like he played space invaders on the atari and once it went past he's like ah yeah this isn't for me you know so i i think a lot of people like like you sit there and play video games like they did a lot of people older than me my generation right. don't compute it you know whereas to us well, I, it, it's yeah. the same it's the same it's just another form of entertainment like movies and television it, it's the it's a norm to us whereas before my generation it wasn't so a lot of people just didn't and don't to this day understand it even though it's there's more yeah. revenue now in the games industry than there is in the movie industry well i would i would say this i would expand it a little more i was born in 1968 i'm 50 years old and so when all that stuff was coming out i was 10 years old right so when you're a 10 year old kid and you see star wars for the first time and tron and raiders of the lost ark and and television atari space invaders pac-man you're 10 to 12 years old it has a huge impact so i think a lot of people who are kind of like 50 and under i think are in that in your generation generation as well it's kind of like cusping it right but but here's the here's the interesting thing though you bring up a great point which is you know and I compare this all the time. I compare the video game industry to the film industry. A lot of people love to compare the numbers and this and that. But what I compare is this, is that when films first came out in the 19-teens and the 1920s, you know, not everybody just jumped on board and started going to the movies. You have to remember, before film, it was all about vaudeville live actors on stage emoting in a personal space right so so when movies first came out people are like what the hell is this these black and white there's no audio there's no acting we have to read this stuff like this isn't even human like that like vaudeville's where it's at these movie things suck right and then movies got sound and then they got color and then they got acting real yeah. acting and then they got storylines and this is a progression but that didn't happen till like 30 40 years later you know when you know things like wizard of oz and gone with the wind and then they got real acting in the late 60s, you know, uh, with, with things like The Graduate and The Godfather in the early 70s and then Star Wars with the effects in the 70s. So it took a whole generation of people that grew up on movies to really understand and before it evolved into our culture. Isn't it interesting, though, when you compare film to the video game industry now, keep in mind, Pong came out in 1972, right? And and it was black and white, barely had any sound, no characters, no storyline, no acting, and then the video game industry got sound, and then the video game industry got color in the, in the early 80s, and then the video game industry started to get storylines and real acting with games like Metal Gear Solid and Halo and Final Fantasy and Warcraft and then we got these amazing effects you know blizzard entertainment and and all these other great things and so think about it like like you said you're the first generation who knew it from birth right so there's still a great number of people baby boomers and above who are on this planet who never grew up on video games, so it didn't evolve into their culture as much as films did, right? So until that happens, we're still only halfway there, my friend. That's the cool part of it, is yeah, that we're true. still only halfway to realize how big this is going to be when my generation starts to become grandparents in 10 15 years then we still got another 15 to 20 years before everybody on this planet grew up playing video games in their life so we're, we're still only scratching the surface that's the fun and cool part yeah it, it, it'll be and it, like i said it's already surpassed at least in the states anyway hollywood in terms of revenue that happened i think last year was the first year that officially happened it, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's interesting because the numbers are a little skewed. I'm always careful when I say things like that because what they do is they they count Hollywood box office versus the entire video game industry. So it's kind of not fair because it includes hardware sales. So you know, it would uh, it would almost be like, well, you'd have to include Blu-ray DVD player. Okay, and okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blu-ray player. So it's it is kind of, but with digital becoming a thing nowadays, now you can play Netflix on your PlayStation Four, your Xbox, your refrigerator, uh, <laughs> basically. You know, you so it's it's it's, it's going to be harder and harder to kind of figure out exactly who spends money on what and how with subscription things and and this and that. But but uh, but that being said, yes, the the point being is that more people here. Here's a better way to judge it instead of dollars and cents. The better way to judge it is the average household in America spends way more time playing video games than they do watching movies, watching TV, listening to music, and reading books. So that's that's the uh, that that's a, a, a really good uh, way to judge it as well, too. Yeah, it's it, it's so weird how something that many people, even in the '80s, and even uh, you could say a small part of the '90s, too, considered a gimmick, ended up becoming a mainstay in, in as a form <laughs> of entertainment. And I, I don't I remember there was the crash in the early eighties and no one saw it. Everyone's like, yeah, it's over with everyone's just going to get computers and, and do other crap on it. Who cares? But here we yeah, are. Yeah. And now it's a multi-billion dollar industry, which well, Nintendo helped to save us in 1985. Nintendo saved it. You know, y- you know, it's funny to too, that. is that people always say, Oh, the crash has happened in the States. Fine. That's true. I get all that. But if it wasn't for Nintendo salvaging the video game industry in the States, I don't think the games industry would be anywhere as big now worldwide as it is mm-hmm. because of what Nintendo did in the U.S. You know, I understand overseas it was doing good, but, you know, America's a big market. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So That's right. So. And, 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 and the thing is, too, the, the thing to realize as well about that is that the problem with the, why did the industry crash, a, a big, if you look at history, you'll, you'll see that what was happening is that they were coming out with good software that were, that were priced in the you know, $30 to $40 range. The problem was is that so many people were making so much garbage that, and they weren't buying it so that they were reducing the price. So it was like a race to the bottom. So you had all these bins, and this a lot of this only happened in America and Europe. In Japan, they were they were more strict about their quality control, right? And so and so all these bins happened. So when people walked in, they stopped buying the thirty forty dollar good games because they're like, well, here's a game for the same system for for four dollars. Why should I pay thirty? Mm-hmm. And and so. You know, there was too much garbage. And by the way, let's be careful, people, because what are we seeing now with mobile? With and now, now the, you know, it's so easy to make games. The tools are so easy. The technology is so advanced. Let's be careful. We see it on mobile, of course. Then look what happens. Um, you know, with, with even the switch now. Even the switch is like becoming a cesspool, a wasteland of exactly. mediocrity. And there's a you lot know? of people, including me, and Steam, was, Steam, the same thing. Steam, yeah, Steam is Steam. Are you may argue is even worse, but the only reason it may be worse is because it's curated and been around longer. But yeah, every week I'll go on, take my switch, and jump just out of curiosity, maybe I'll pick something up, and I go look at their on the eShop, and I don't even know where to begin. So a lot of times exactly. I'm just like I don't even know what game is good and bad. They don't have a rating system, which Nintendo get on the friggin' ball with that. Have a star system to That's let me right. know. And so That's I'm just right. like I'm not going to buy anything because I don't know what's good or not. And some of the games they're no name games, but they're still going for twenty or thirty bucks. So I'm like I'm not going to spend that money having no idea what I'm going into, and I can't even find it. I feel like I'm back in '84 again where I can't find anything online, and here's this game here exactly. that I don't know anything about. So. And, yeah. and so, and that interesting thing when when we made the announcement that we're only going to have exclusive games on our console, people, a lot of people, hardcores, flipped out like, "Oh my God, are you crazy? You're stupid. What are you thinking?" And so, let me let me just clarify that when we said no ports, what we mean is no direct ports. The fifty games that we listed on our press release are all 
games that have pre-existed that we're going to reimagine. So clearly we're taking games on our system, but the ones that are going to appear on our system okay. are exclusive to our system. So I didn't think, I, I thought that that was obvious. So I guess it was a mistake on my part. I should have said no direct ports, but people are flipping out like, oh, I'm never going to buy this system because because, you know, whatever is not going to be on it. And it's like, well, well, wait a second. But we listed 50 games from other systems that are clearly porting, you know, that we're going to we're going to just going to port them and it's going to be exclusive to us, the content. So the version of Pong, let's say, is the most basic. The version of Pong will not appear anywhere else. It won't be on your cell phone. It won't, the version that we do, because we're going to make it special. The levels, the multiplayer, the way it controls, the, 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 you know, the, the effects, the way we're going to do it is going to be specific for our machine. So that doesn't mean that we couldn't do a Tetris or a Sonic the Hedgehog. Maybe we'll do that on our system, but, it, but it's going to be exclusive. So if we redo Sonic from scratch, the original game, no one else is going to be able to put that point. And you say, well, why would Sega ever do something like that? Well, let me give you an example, a really great example of one of the, of the biggest entertainment company in the world. Let's take Disney. They're the biggest entertainment company on the planet now, right? They own Marvel. They own the Star Wars franchise, everything, okay? Now, let's talk. What is their biggest license over the last 30 years? Their biggest license was Star Frozen. Wars. Well, I was going to say Exc Star excluding, Wars. Excluding, excluding the Star Wars stuff. Okay. Like Disney, okay. As Disney as a company, their biggest their biggest license was the Frozen license, right? How come there isn't a Frozen video game on modern consoles? Because there's no modern consoles out here, right? That are, are you going to put a Frozen game on a PlayStation Four? On the Xbox, are there ten-year-old girls buying Xbox Ones that I don't know about? You know, and even the Nintendo Switch. Well, there, there, there could the, the Switch. Like, there could be like you know, my my stepdaughter is twelve years old and she plays on an Xbox One. So I, I get what you're saying, yeah, though. It's her average. The average. What are they? Okay. Is Disney going to spend twenty million bucks to create a triple A amazing three D experience, or would they rather do something? you know, on a system like ours. I, I can tell you the answer, but I can't say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I think everyone could read you on that, which speaking of which, that's a perfect segue over into talking about the Intellivision Amico. So the first question I have before we get into the system, which I said, like I said, I'm interested in, you, you sold me with the trailer, but I still have concerns, like I said in my video. How the hell did you get into being a president of Intellivision Entertainment? What happened? How did that even start? Well, I mean, passion is is the is the short answer. Um, you know, I when I, you know when I, my mom bought a you know Christmas nineteen eighty, uh, she bought a in television, uh, and you you know if you recall back then. Um, I know you were born in the 80s, but but back then people didn't have multiple consoles like they do now. You either had Atari or you had Intellivision. And then a few years later, you know, ColecoVision came a little later. But but back in the late 70s, you were either Intellivision or Atari. You didn't have multiple ones. So we, my, me and my dad loved sports. And, you know, the sports games were better on Intellivision, so we bought the Intellivision. Um, and so I was an Intellivision fanboy my whole life. That was my real the system. And me and my family played it together. My younger brother, we all played it as a family. When I think of my childhood, I think of the four of us sitting around the TV okay. playing Intellivision. That's, that's what I think of when I think of my childhood. Great, good times. I bring a tear to my eye. I get goosebumps, the whole thing. And so when I got in the video game industry, Victor Lucas, in fact, when we were doing the TV show, we started to go back and, and let's find all these guys who like started Atari and who started, you know, we went to Nolan Bushnell's house and uh, this amazing mansion and saw the original Pong stuff. And, and also we, we started to do stories on the show. Well, one of those stories was we found who the current president of Intellivision was. His name was Keith Robinson. And so this is very important for a lot of people to know as well. I think people will, will, will find this really interesting and cool. The company in television never 
went like you know out of business it, it never like so for example hmm. the atari for example you know atari is owned by a french holding company and they license different things and okay this company is going to do the atari box the atari vcs and this company is going to do hats or speakers and this company will do games and this whatever you know so so there's you know different things but one thing we just mentioned the crash of 1983 Believe it or not, in television, survive. They were the only console maker to survive the crash. So here's how the story went. Mattel Electronics owned in television. They were the ones who started it. In 1983, the industry crashes, and Mattel says, you know what? We're out of here. Uh, we're not making money. We're laying everybody off, and we're getting out of the video game industry. Five of the in original employees of Intellivision said, wait a second. We love this. We think it's this is great. We want to buy Intellivision from you, Mattel, and we want to keep it going. And Mattel says, all right, you know, why not? We were just going to like let it die and get nothing. So, okay, you want, and, it, and they paid like around $300,000 for it. And that was in 1983. That's a lot of money back then. And that's how much these people cared to keep in television going. So they, so then it switched from Mattel and then it was called INTV. Those were, that's what they renamed because they couldn't call it Mattel in television. They called it INTV in television, right? And they kept the hardware going and the software going all the way to 1990. So the wow. Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo had come out and these guys were still manufacturing and making uh, making in television carts and, and games and software and hardware. Keep in mind, in television was the very first 16-bit console. But by that time, when Super Mario World and Sonic the Hedgehog was up, the sales were like, you know, going like crazy. So they closed up the company in 1990. And then about five, six years later, another group of employees said, hey, we want to keep this thing going because now 20 years had passed almost since since the original and we want to do t-shirts we want to do in television games that for pc and for the playstation and because the playstation had come out at that point and all the game systems so they revived it they purchased it from the other folks and and these and that's keith robinson steve roney bill fisher a bunch of a bunch of those guys who were there at in television since the 70s and 80s and they ran it all the way up until last summer. And the and, and Keith Robinson, who's a very dear friend of mine, who I got to know, I met him through Electric Plague, a very dear friend of mine, he passed away last summer. I remember hearing and that. Yeah. He was, yeah, and he was such a great guy, big heart, like a big one of these big guys who's like a big teddy bear, kind of like you. <laughs> and so <laughs> you remind me of Keith. And, and, and so... What I did is I came in and, and, and me and Keith had talked about reviving in television two, three years ago. We had talked and I said, look, Keith, with my contacts and, and all the people I know in the industry, we should do another console. He said, oh, my God, that would be great. We need to find money. I don't know how we would do so we started talking about it but then you know life happens i'm always on the road with video games live we never really connected to like make it happen when keith passed away and the people who worked with keith and the other owners knew this knew that i was involved so when he passed away um we we all got together the remaining and i pitched him the whole idea about the amico and what i wanted to do and the vision for the company and they were like this is great. We're a hundred percent on board. Here we go. So at that point, that's when we formed in television entertainment, a new company was formed with the owners. So there are five people who are working with in television right now, who've been there since 1981. Wow. So it's amazing. Okay. So it's and I got to tell you, when you have those people, it's it's like a dugout in baseball. And they always talk about, you have the guy around who's been there forever, and he's like the all-star. He teaches the young kids, and there's that vibe, that clubhouse vibe. He was a great clubhouse player. You know, they talk about that. Well, that's how it is in, in television. These people are around, 
And by the way, they're still kind of pissed at Atari. They kind of still don't like Atari. <laughs> you know, that was that was like 40 years ago. So they're like, oh, we're going to get Atari this time, 40 years later. You know, and it's all. Well, you're probably, which, you, which the irony is, is that you probably are, whether they're kidding or not, because Eddie. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's actually a perfect segue. So how did the Amico like the concept come to be that you so you you're coming out and it, not only is it a flooded console market of conventional consoles now you have all these yeah. other companies trying to resurrect their brands you know how did we, wh- what made yeah. you sit down and think about out the Kamiko and what direction to go with it well you know the interesting thing was is that from a personal standpoint I always wanted to play all these great in television games that I love, Tron Deadly Discs and Utopia and the baseball and Shark Shark and Astro Smash. I always wanted like a, a, a like a photorealistic, updated multiplayer version. Because one of the things that sucked about the old in television was if you wanted to play sports games, you had to have another person, right? You could never play by yourself. Uh, but um, and so what what we're doing is. Uh, um, you know, so I always just I wanted different versions, updated versions of these games, and I thought, boy, how cool it would be to have a touch screen instead of those dumb overlays and and, and all that stuff. So, so um, it, but but here's the biggest thing for me: I've been in the industry almost thirty years now. For the last twelve years, I go to E. For the last decade, every year I go to E3. I see every single video game that's being made that's displayed at E3 is for hardcore gamers. And every year it gets worse and worse. I want to relive those times where I remember sitting with my mom and dad and my younger brother playing video games. It was, it was you know, it, it was a conduit to family time. It was a conduit to fun, to memories. You know, I got to be honest with you. I'm 50 years old now. When I sit down and I'm right about to do Red Dead 2, of course, I just finished Spider-Man, God of War 4 before that, and I go on these like 30, 40-hour binges, and when you get to be our age, I don't know if you feel this way, but it's like you almost kind of feel a little guilty you know it's yes, like oh my god yep. I learned a language I could have spent time with my wife and kids my dog I could have built a shed I could have you know but when you talk so when you, when I play these single player video games now and even multiplayer stuff but but when you spend time with your family that never feels like a waste of time. That never feels so. So can I bring this? So that was the whole concept behind it. Was look one, I want to play games with my mom and dad again. They're still alive. They're seventy-seven years old. I can't put a PlayStation Four controller or even a Switch controller in my dad's hands or my mom's hands. Hey, mom, here's uh, Zelda: Breath of the Wild. Go for it. I can't <laughs> yeah. do it. Right. And, and, and the problem, and a lot of people have been saying, well, geez, you know, you're, what you're talking about is casual games, mobile gamings. This already exists, you dumbass. And I say, no, it doesn't. Because casual games on mobile, which, by the way, very important for people to understand, si- over 60% of the video game market is on mobile now. 23%. 23% of the money made in the gaming industry is from the consoles, and it's even less than that for PCs. So sometimes I think people got to step out of their own bubble. world bubble to realize what, look at the industry as a whole. The console market has been shrinking over the years. Not a lot, but it's like 1% to 2% each year over the last 10 years. The PC market has been shrinking over the last 10 years. And the mobile market has been completely booming. Now, what that tells me is this, is that people would love to play video games. And casual games are the only place they can get them now is on mobile. Now three times more than every console combined. So when, and so, but the problem with mobile is this, it's a very solitary experience. It's you and a cell phone, that's it. 
Now you can say, well, there's Pokemon Go. Yeah, have you ever been to a po co Pokemon Go? It's 30 people all sitting around looking at their phones, you know. And yes. so like, even, there's not a family of four sitting in the living room all playing a mobile game together. Now, I'm not saying they don't exist. They do. But I'm talking about the average gameplay experience on mobile is one person solitary on their phone multiplayer on gaming uh, multiplayer online uh, gaming is again you on a computer or you in a room with your xbox and your headphones on you're not communicating with the people around you you got to understand that people who are like millennials and younger every video game system that they had that they bought came with one controller right for well, the yeah. most part. Yeah, for the most the part. The place, yeah. the Xbox, and one controller. So they don't know. Like, I I read, like, negative comments online from, like, younger, hardcore gamers. Like, why would anyone want to play in a room with anyone else? Like, why? that's, like, stupid. Which is ridiculous. Like, why would, you know? And I remember, like, even in the early, mid-90s, the most fun that me and my friends had was like when GoldenEye came out in the end. I was just about to use the same example when you played four player GoldenEye. Granted, it ran at 12 frames per second, but it was still awesome, though. Oh my God, it was so awesome. And, and Mario Kart. And those were the. When I think of my finest and my most fun gaming experiences, it was always when there were other people in the room because you're giving each other crap and you're, you know, you're, you know, and oh, I almost won. Let me, let's do it again. Let's keep playing again. There's a whole generation of folks who don't even know what's that like. All they know is, you know, getting called a douchebag by some 12 year old online through their headsets. I mean, what kind of crap is online gaming? gaming these days it's become like people are afraid to even do it you know like because of because of the you know the nastiness of a lot of it and again i'm not saying every community like that the blizzard community are a bunch of amazing incredible people um you know they, they don't get harassed as much as like let's say some folks on the xbox or some folks on some playstation games you know they, you know it's out there there's sexism there's ageism there's all sorts of isms happening uh, on online gaming. When you're in front of each other and you're playing with your friends, that's an experience you you uh, you you remember for the rest of your life. And that's what we're trying to recreate. No, not trying. That's what we're going to recreate with the Intellivision Amico. And that's why Amico. That's why I chose the name. It means friend in Italian. You know. So not only is it about friends that you're playing. Not only is it family friendly content that we're going to be putting out but also we want the device itself to seem like a friend in the household because you know take something like a tamagotchi or a furby you know all it is is circuit boards and wires but you feel a connection to it because of the way they put that together you kind of cared for it in this you know you have a relationship with this this these wires well when i think of my playstation 4 which i love by the way by no means of uh, anything that i say is i'm trying to put down the others for doing what they do i'm a playstation huge fanboy i have an xbox one i have a nintendo switch i love it all right but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, you and please don't ever compare Amico to a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox or a Switch, because I give the comparison like this. You can drive a Ferrari if you wanted to have any car in the world. Maybe you want a Ferrari. It's fast. It's sleek. It's powerful. It only has two seats, but it's it's the it's the echelon of like amazing sports cars. I'm not trying to create a Prius to the Ferrari. What we're saying is, you know what? You can own a Ferrari, but you know what else you can own? A bicycle. And a bicycle is a completely different experience. Yes, it gets you from point A to point B, but a bicycle, you can have five or six friends come along, you're going slower, you're enjoying the environment, you're smelling, you're breathing the air, you're, you're, you're taking in the nature you know so it's a different experience altogether that's not to say that ferraris are bad i love ferraris right but but think of us as a bicycle not a prius 
to a Ferrari, right? And so, Amico, I want the console to feel like it's alive. It's a friend in your home, like the Furby was, like a Tamagotchi was. And that's why we have these interactive lights that are on the system. It's, the system is going to be awake. It's going to real. It's going to give you feedback. It's going to give you rewards if you finish a level. If 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 you knock somebody down in a boxing game or hit a home run, let's pretend like there's camera flash bulbs. If if, if imagine a game like Metal Gear Solid. Not that Metal Gear's on the console, but imagine the concept Metal Gear Solid in that point where where the where you get realized and the and the exclamation point. What if the siren went off in your living room like oh my god holy crap you know it puts you in in the game now obviously people might find that distracting and we have a switch on the box that you can shut off if you want to shut it off too as well so if you want to put your friend to sleep and tell him to shut up you can do that too but anyway so that that's a little bit more i know we we, we hit on a bunch of different things no, that's <laughs> fine it, it, it kind of goes into what i was going to ask anyway so there's two things one you are the only company that's been ballsy enough to say an exact date for release that I don't even think that sometimes Sony and at least for a while anyway what they would do. So and the second thing is with you have a price range from 149 to 179 which isn't bad but at the same time with that release date even though it is in a different market than what like you'll see with Sony and Microsoft doing you're releasing a system that could go up to close to 200 bucks on the mm-hmm. eve of pretty much we could almost guarantee at least one of the next gen consoles are going to come out how would you sell it even though it's a different animal and i listened to what you said how would you sell it to somebody when maybe a month from that release date there may be a playstation 5 or a next xbox when the price Mm -hmm. which what is the difference in between prices that could be storage is that what that's going to be we're for 149 lower storage or more storage all great questions well first of all let me tell you that i do have spies uh, I've been in the industry for a long time. I, so I would assume that you I did. Have, I would hope that you did with how, how long you've been around. I, ha- I have spies at Sony. I have spies at Microsoft. And I have spies at Nintendo. Uh, and so so that's – but these are all great questions. Um, but um, so it, first one, in, in regards to um, the price point. Mm-hmm. So w- the reason I said 149 to 179 – is simply this, is because two years out, as you mentioned, it's still a long year out, I did not want to lock myself into one price point. Components, computer chips, more than any other industry, this stuff comes down in price. So if we had to build the machine right now, Sometimes it could go up if, if you're using a certain component in your device and all of a sudden Apple needs to order 10 million of them. Now, all of a sudden they become scarce. So our component selection and manufacturing is being handled by one of the biggest companies and successful companies on the planet. They're called Avnet. Uh, Google them, Wikipedia. Well, go to their Wikipedia page. Look at Avnet. Um, there are you know, manufacturing partners in in this, so so we won't have to worry about oh my gosh, this component isn't available now. So everything we're doing is very very well thought out and specific, right? Um, and so the reason I say one forty nine and one seventy nine isn't that it's going to have different storage things. It's just that. We're being honest and saying, we don't know. We'd like it to be 149, but it could be 179 or somewhere in between. Until we go into manufacturing, we'll know a year from now. A year from now, we'll know. But I wanted to put those numbers out there because, I one, it's not going to go over that. No, it's smart. And so if you, you, know? if you promise a low ball price point like 149 and it ends up being closer to 179 you know you'll that'll that'll just spur up a whole bunch of drama and you've seen how that happens with the other companies which honestly mostly they deserve it but you know you just know that was actually a smart move to be safe like that because uh, yeah i know and it was was important though that that we gave an a range so that people don't think you know like like the like the atari vcs 299 399 like I didn't want people to think we were going to be in that range, but I also didn't want people to think it was a $99 knockoff piece of crap, 
uh, you know, emulator box, whatever. So, so it was important to tell our story about the quality that we're going for. And, and that's why we gave that price range. To answer your other question, what's going to, you know, you know, how, how are you going to tell this story on 10, 10, 20, 20? If there's another Xbox or another PlayStation or another Nintendo coming out a month later or a month earlier or whatever, how are you going to compete? The answer is very simple, is that, you know, we don't see ourselves competing on that level. People are going to buy PlayStation 5s, right, no matter what. We're again, it's that Ferrari and bicycle thing. Just because you bought a new Ferrari because the new Ferrari is coming out that year doesn't mean that you're going to not want to ride a bicycle anymore. And and remember, our target audience isn't necessarily the people who are going to be the first buyers of PlayStation 5 or the first buyers of Xbox. What are they going to call it? Xbox 2? Who knows? Yeah, who the hell knows uh, what the name is going to be in that frame? <laughs> they, they're well, they're naming... The, I think that the, with the <laughs> Xbox, they may have the worst... No, Nintendo still beats him, but they, they're the, close uh, to the Wii, worst naming scheme. I still scheme. can't get to say... Yeah, I still can't get used to Wii. And Wii U. Uh, what the hell was the Wii U? But that I've beaten that Wii story to that. Well, that, I honestly yeah. think, too, getting totally off topic, that was a, a, a substantial part of the reason why that system was a failure. I remember having that in my apartment, um, and, and I would have people come over going, oh, what, what, they would see the controller, and like, oh, that's the Wii U. Like, oh, what do you get that for the Wii? I'm talking like a year and a half, almost two years after the system came out. That was a big fail for sure, um, and and so um, and, and so that so that's my point is that I think the early adapters, the f- hardcore video game folks, probably aren't going to be the first people to buy a Miko. You know, I think again the casual gamers, the moms and dads. Here's here's a great stat for you: the Nintendo Wii was 12 years ago it's it's crazy to seem that it was <laughs> that it was that long ago but when the nintendo wii they did something amazing they proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that non-gamers are willing to purchase a home video game console right 103 million units nintendo pushed out of that and it was the third biggest selling video game home console ever of all time. Huge. They caught lightning in a bottle. But here's where I would argue where they kind of didn't take full advantage of that. About half the people who bought the system only ever bought it for bowling. They only ever bought one game. Oh, I've been, I was saying that from day one, absolutely. Well, Right. And so my mom has bought two video game consoles in her entire life. Christmas 1980 and then television. And 12 years ago, she bought a Wii for herself so that her and my aunts and uncles could get together, open a bottle of wine and go bowling. Now, me and you both know that the Wii Sports was nothing more than a tech demo. Yet. It's the fourth biggest selling video game ever of all time. It's insane, right? And so it just goes to show you how, you know, you know, how important grabbing, you know, and again, I I hate the word casual gamer or non-gamer. You know, the reality is this. If you're a living, breathing person on this planet and you can have fun with your family, I don't care if it's Monopoly, the board game. Or the Intellivision Amico, right? It's like that's what we're selling. We're selling families and friends getting together to have fun. And for all the negative naysayers out there, oh, this sucks, dead on arrival, screw you, you're idiots, blah, blah, blah. I would just say to you, look, all we're saying is we want a simple, fun machine where we can bring back getting people in a room, anyone, not just hardcore gamers, but anyone in the world, is that such an awful thing to, to want in, in, in this lifetime, you know? And, and it, it's funny, it reminds me, one of my favorite books is um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And there's a great opening paragraph, the first paragraph to the first book, uh, the first chapter, and he, and he, he kind of talks about, he says, you know, human beings are, are, are odd creatures, you know? They, they once, 2,000 years ago, they nailed this guy to a cross because he went around telling everyone how great it would be if we were all nice to each other. 
<laughs> you know, and so it's like I, I kind of feel the same way. It's like, look, all we're saying is, wouldn't it be great for everyone to want to play video games together? And like, you're an idiot. You're stupid. But, oh, oh, sorry, geez, I didn't know. Well, speaking so, of uh, uh, from a technical standpoint, and this is something I read in a couple articles, and I, I, I you're probably the best person to confirm or deny it that your 2D tech inside the system will be superior. Terrible. Yes, that was total bullshit. Okay. Completely. I never, never said that. I'll tell you what I said and how it got. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I would have forgot. And you're the best. Part, I was because I was thinking like, wow, that's that's a bold <laughs> statement. Okay. That's right. That's right. Um, yes. What they they said for the f- folks who don't know, listening to this, what they said that I said. It was a bullet point of my keynote address that I gave. And one of the things was, Tommy says that the graphics and the tech for 2D is going to be better than anything the PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 5 can push out. And so people read that and said, oh, he's saying it's better than PlayStation 5. How does he even know what PlayStation 5 is? He's an idiot, blah, blah, blah. He, has no, he doesn't know anything at all about technology and 2D and how it works. And, and then people started comparing, oh, well, the way you do 3D now is different than the way you did 2D back then and, and the pixels and the voxels and the boom, 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 boom. This is what I said. And this is what I meant to communicate. Maybe I said it the wrong way, but this is what I meant to communicate, Okay. What I said was this. What I was trying to communicate was this. When 2D games, the way that developers and programmers approached 2D was a very, very different way than they approach 3D. That's a fact, right? Back in the old days, when people were doing 2D games on the, you know, they were using like assembly language. They were able to talk directly to the chip, to the board. They were able to get their hands dirty and really make stuff happen back then, right? A lot of times where it became uh, more difficult, their jobs was trying to create as many sprites on screen as they can. You know, that was always the job. How can we trick the human eye into gaining more sprites on screen, right? But consider this. The last 2D architecture was really, when it was a full-on, was the Super Nintendo. The, 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 the Dreamcast was also 2D at first, but then they kind of changed it halfway through, and then they, they saw what Tekken was doing on the PlayStation. Well, the the, Sa- the Saturn was actually supposed to be a, just a 2D-only <laughs> beast, and then, they, Sorry, the then when they saw what the PlayStation was doing, they crapped themselves. I remember that. Exactly. Sorry, I meant to say the Saturn. I said the Dreamcast on accident. That's right. The Saturn. Uh, the Saturn was, you know, kind of half 2D, half not. But the real, the last 2D great machine was the Super Nintendo. That was 1990. So by the time the Amico comes out, 30 years would have passed where, you know, the technology and creativity and tool sets and everything would be 30 years in technology is a long, long time. So what we're saying is this, is that we are going to provide tools and hardware software, APIs, SDKs, tutorials, uh, you know, sample code, all of this stuff we are going to provide and it's just for 2D. It's just focused on 2D. Can you, will you be able to do 3D games in our system? Yeah, you can if you want. You I was know. just about to ask you if it's actually 3D capable. You just took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. Yeah, could, could, could you use Unity and try to create something that, that looks decent on the machine? Probably if you wanted to, but it's not our focus, right? You're going to, so what I was saying was, is that for, for developers and programmers, we are going to make it so easy and we are going to focus our architecture and our tools and our APIs, our SD, all of our things around 2D that it is going to be easier for them to program and create 2D games on our platform than it will be on any other system. And that's going to be a fact. Now, you know, you take a, 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 a program like Game Maker, for example. 
Game Maker Studio is a, is a 2D. I mean, you know, Toby Fox used it to create Undertale. This is a, you know, so amazing million plus selling games have been made with this. But it's a very basic tool. It's a very basic 2D, you know, simple, you know, kind of freshman to noob kind of tool. That, that's, that's great. <laughs> it's amazing. But what we're talking about is we're creating stuff in 2D that is Game Maker Studio times 100 that we can, you know, that we're designing ourselves that is going to make it the easiest it has ever been to create 2D games. And that's what I said. And that was kind of, t- and I even said, I said it will be easier to create 2D games on our system than it will on the PlayStation 4. Because the PlayStation 4, it, it, and again, look at the people on our uh, advisory board and who work for us. Look at a guy like Mike Micah, okay? He's a guy who's been doing 2D games on the next-gen platforms for 20 years. I think he knows what he's talking about when it comes to 2D. Look at, look at, go back and look at the guys who did Cuphead. And they'll tell you that Cuphead, as a 2D game, they were reaching the limits of, of what the machine could do, right? Oh wow! I didn't know. I didn't know and that. And so what? We're, absolutely. And and so what we're saying is is that we want to make it easy for the guys who made Cuphead. We want to make it easier for them and give them more resources to de- to develop another game. And so people say, well, but but idiot, you said your games are exclusive, so you'll never have Cuphead on your system. Well, wait, why couldn't we approach those guys, give them our tools and say, hey, let's do a diff- an Amico version of Cuphead which has different levels, different graphics, different gameplay elements, or maybe we do a, a, let's approach that studio and do a completely new IP, or maybe a, you know, this and that. So so just because they do it for our system doesn't mean, let's say they do Cuphead 2, and I'm making all this up, we have not talked to them at all, just to be clear, I wanna clarify that. I'm just using them as an example, but it just, you know, take anything, Shovel Knight, take any, you know, kind of awesome 2D game, Undertale. We can approach those folks and say, you know, just because, hey, would you like to do Shovel Knight 2 or Shovel Knight Adventures or Shovel Knight Remastered on our system, what we're saying is we'll pay for it. We'll pay for it. We'll pay you guys to do that. But the version that you do can only be on our system. We don't want you to put it on Xbox. We don't want the same exact game to be on that. That doesn't mean you can't make another Shovel shovel Knight game. It doesn't mean you can't make Cuphead 2 and have it be different or different graphics or different gameplay. Besides, with the way our controllers are set up, you're going to want to redo it anyway, you know. So, so that's. I just wanted to clarify all that. As you're, well. you're, it's funny because what you're saying <laughs> is bringing up is bringing up questions. Now, the thing about mm-hmm. know, exclusive games. The first thing is, how are you going to go? Which maybe it'll be a financial incentive that you that you'll give developers. A developer, even especially an indie developer, they're like, okay, they want a, a exclusive game for the Amico, but I can put that same game on a, a PlayStation platform where there's eighty plus million people that have it. How the hell are you going to get them to do that? That's a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked. So here's our whole approach. You have to understand when when you look at the people at the end of that trailer who've been in the industry. We have, you know, between us all, we have hundreds and hundreds of years, very successful people, right? We got from the producer of Metal Gear Solid to the guy who created Gaikai, you know, David Perry, who cre- who created the, the you know, some of the architecture, uh, some of the online stuff, the cloud gaming for the PlayStation. We have m- guys like Mike Micah. We have Jason Enos, producer of Metal Gear Solid. I saw, Tekken, yeah, you have some impressive people Castle. go with you. I mean, Right, we got the the heads of who 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 launched the Nintendo Wii and the Nintendo DS and the Pokemon, you know, marketing and PR. They're they're all playing for our side now, um, you know. And so we, you know, so what we do is we all sit around a room together, and we say, what's wrong with the video game industry? We all know what's wrong with it, right? We know what's wrong with it from a sales from a marketing, from a hardware, from a software, from an end user experience, and from a developer's side of things. So here's what we know about developers in this day and age. 
and you can talk to indie developers about this. What's the biggest challenge that an indie developer has? Well, there's a couple. The first thing is, a very dear friend of mine, Cliff Blazinski, when a guy like that, who's as talented as he is, and has a lot of money, and creates a new studio, when he's his studio goes under because he has a couple of mediocre hits, you know there's something wrong with the game industry at that point. So one of the problems with indie developers, let's call them mid-size indie developers, the problem is, is because they're creating so much content in 3D, you need tons of artists, you need tons of programmers, you need you need people who are doing motion capture, texture mm-hmm. mapping, splines, you know, so many different things that it takes a lot of resources in a, you know, to get a AAA game up and running these days, right? And God forbid you have a mediocre game because now you just crashed and burned and you, the $10 million is gone, right? And so, but the biggest problem is, and so what we're saying is the great thing about only doing 2D games is that you don't need $10 million to make a game. You don't even need a million dollars to make a game for our system. You know, um, there are going to be better experiences that, than, sell ga- than mobile games, right? Um, but they're not going to be 40-hour one player adventure things it's not it's not look there's other systems that are doing that out there we're focusing on fun gameplay mechanics that you can play with 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 your family and friends that's what we're focused on right that doesn't take a whole truckload of cash to design and create games like that we know i can tell you you know the average uh the the average um development cost for an intellivision game and again this is going to fluctuate but i can tell you right now it's around 200 to 250 thousand dollars right so you're talking like five six seven people on a team two programmers two or three artists a designer a producer whatever you know maybe audio guy or whatever and and those people are working in you know five six seven months on a a game again you can do the math in your head to what people make per month and and this and that and you'll see that it's you know anywhere from 150 to 300 thousand dollars to make a really high quality game in 2d that we're talking about again not every game is going to be cuphead not every game is going to be you know this and that so uh you know because i'm sure they spent more than that on cuphead but um so but my point being is that so so the the risk is going to be a lot less to make games for us that's the first thing but the most important thing is a lot of these small studios and even small publishers they don't have a marketing department they don't have millions of dollars to spend on marketing and ads and facebook and this and that they're praying that people will talk about it that influencers will talk about it and make videos on youtube they're they're working it hard to try to get everybody with no budget to or a very little budget to find out about their game. Why? Because there's thousands of games that come out every week on mobile. There's hundreds of games that come out every week on Switch now. Hundreds and thousands of games that are coming out on Steam every few weeks. It is become, because now it's so easy to create video games now, where you don't even really have to be a talented programmer. You can just bring up a game studio or figure out Unity and this and that. And, you know, all of the finesse is kind of going away now because anyone can create a fart app and put it up there and start making money, right? And so we're not interested in those games on our system. We don't want those games either, right? We want quality. If we only have 50 developers making games for us, I'm fine with that. I'm not trying to get 10,000 developers. We're not trying to have a thousand games on our system at launch. We do not want that. It is, why has it become quantity over quality? Why is that? Why Why do systems brag about this? I, I would rather have 20 above average, really quality titles than 100 mediocre ones right and so that's so where we're helping developers to answer your question really direct because i get going and i get off on tangents and i apologize i just get so passionate about this (laughs) but 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 what we're doing is the intent and this is an exclusive i haven't really told anyone this okay 
uh, the developers know, but but I haven't said this you know out loud to to in the public. What we're doing is the way that we curate our store. We are with you from the beginning. So if you're a developer, you give us your original concept. You say, hey, I'm thinking about doing a game that's X, Y, and Z, and I need money to make it. And it's, you know, it's again, it's not a triple A game. Well, define triple A. You know, does triple A mean you spent 30 million bucks, or does triple A mean, you know, I mean, Angry Birds, I would consider a triple A game. Uh, Candy Crush is a triple A game. And I can the tell money you, they're bringing you know, in, because the money is what makes it a triple A game mostly. Right. So, so let's let's be careful how we define AAA. But, 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 just my 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 thing is they'll bring us a game, and they'll say, "Look, here's a mid-level game that Sony's not going to pay us to make this. Apple isn't going to pay him to make this. Google, Facebook, you know, this is a game that we believe has a really fun game me- gameplay mechanic. And will will you help us make this game? The answer is wow, we love this. Yes, let's go forward with okay, this. Okay. We're now you're now your partner from day one. But here's the best part about it. And here's what I've never told anyone. There will never ever. It's going to blow your mind, and a lot of people are going to hate on me. I don't care because it's the right way. There will never ever be two games released at the same time on the Intellivision Amico. What that does is... Puts the spotlight on that game. Exactly. And I don't care if you're Ubisoft, EA, or Activision, or you're some dorm room developer. You, They're both going to get the same amount of space and time. So if we turn out everything every 10 days to 14 days there's a brand new game that means that that small developer gets the number one spotlight front page of the store it's like in the old days when you used to get the front cover of egm or the old days when you would get the end cap unit well they still have those the end cap unit at best buy or or, or you know or, or the or the front page of the sunday circular the game of the week what's the game of the week all of okay. the attention will be on their game so i ask you if you're a small mid size and even a big developer would you rather be the head honcho lead game and us pushing it like crazy the whole time from the time we start the game because we want it to succeed because if it doesn't reach a certain quality standard we'll kill it even though it's our money we'll we'll still kill it because i'm not going to put out crappy games on our system right would you rather be there with a hardware manufacturer that is pushing you and promoting that is put- you in, and promoting the heck out of your game and making it the number one thing or would you rela- would you rather release a game on Steam where a thousand other games are coming out that week, or I say Steam, or I say the Wii, uh, sorry, the Switch, or I say the mobile gaming, or would you rather t- take your chances and roll your dice on there and, and hope, th- hope maybe it becomes big? Because I got news for you. There are thousands, not hundreds, there are thousands of super duper talented developers that are creating games for mobile that you have never heard of and have never played because they're getting lost and they don't have marketing maybe they don't have marketing chops maybe they're really smart artistic programmers and artists maybe they're really smart in that category but not in the business and marketing side that's okay those are the kind of people we want to take under our wing we want to make them rock stars that's our goal. I always say to all the developers talk, I talk to, one of my first lines out of the gate is I say, I'll tell you what my goal is. My goal is to make you a millionaire. That is my goal. And, and I, want, I want to be going down to, to the Ferrari uh, you know, car dealership with you, and we're gonna, I want to help you pick out your, 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 next, your Ferrari. You know, so, it's, uh, you know, so we as a hardware people care more about those people than and other hardware companies combined because I understand, and the people who are at the company, we understand that, look, I could tell you how great the system is going to be all day and night, but the reality is this 
we're not kickstarting. We're not crowdfunding. We're not an Indiegogo. I don't want you to pay for that. That is true. I didn't even think of that. Oh, crap. Until you had a chance to play it. I don't want your money until you play the games. And that's where, because I know that it's all going to come out, come down to the games. And who makes those games? Yes, we have three internal teams that are working first party games for us. But the life and blood of this entire console is going to come down to the amazing people on the outside who are going to think of things that we never thought of, who are going to use the controller in ways we never dreamed of, who are going to come up with art and concepts that we never thought were, were, were capable or available. We understand. And you look at all the systems over the years that have tanked, 3DO, Ouya, Wii U, what do all those games, uh, 3DO, what, what do all those systems have in common? They didn't have a must-play exclusive game. And you look at all the consoles that succeeded. You think gamers liked Microsoft? Are you kidding me? You know, Microsoft was a spreadsheet company, mm -hmm. right? People didn't buy the Xbox because they thought Microsoft was cool or they thought Bill Gates was a, was a cool guy. They bought the Xbox because it was the only place you could play Halo at the time. And people loved it, and they knocked it out of the park. Crash Bandicoot for the PlayStation, Super Mario World for, for, for uh, the, the Super Nintendo, and the Genesis is a really interesting one because at the time, and again, this was before social media and, and instant you know, gratification on, on, on if a game sucks or not, but back then, the Genesis came out, Mega Drive in Europe, as you know. The first game it came out with was Altered Beast. The Sega's numbers were not doing great because Altered Beast was like, meh, right? It wasn't until Sonic the Hedgehog came out, boom, now you got the must-play game, blast processing, <laughs> whatever the hell that was, uh, and, it, and, it, and it zooms the system into the stratosphere forever in the company. Now, this day and age, Sega, if Sega came out, if the Sega Genesis came out now with social media and it came out with Altered Beast, it would have been dead on arrival. Everyone would have attacked it. Everyone would have said, this sucks. The word would have spread and the system would have failed. So we, and Ui is a perfect example of that, right? Yeah. So we know, we know we're not using the Sega Genesis model. Hey, let's put it out there and then maybe we'll get a game in a year or two. We know that if that, if our system doesn't come out with two or three exclusive must have games, we're dead. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I say. And to all the haters out there, I would just say this. Instead of saying, you suck, stupid idea, no one's going to buy this, I would just say this to you. How about this instead? How about until you play it, STFU? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's what I would say. Until you play it, give me the – you don't even have to give me the benefit of the doubt. Just don't don't hate on it until you've played it because i'm not asking for your money i'm not doing what Ouya did i'm not doing what the the the, the coleco chameleon did and i'm not yeah, doing even what God. the Atari bcs did the Atari, and i got news for you if anyone thinks that you can start a company a hardware company on three million dollars you're high you're you're yeah. you're out of your flipping mind right we to do what we're doing it takes tens of millions of dollars. And I'm never going to ask anyone for money before they have a chance to play the machine. And if you find it fun, and if there's games on there that you can't get anywhere else that you find fun and you want to play, then you can buy the machine. Until then, there's no sense in anyone talking about it because we have to show gameplay footage. And a lot of people said they called us a task. They said, yeah, well, this is great, but I don't see any gameplay footage. Screw you. Good point. When And, and so our next major trailer is going to come out. And we knew this going in. Look, it was a reveal trailer. Well, why do you, why do you, you know, why did you come out with a reveal trailer without showing uh, gameplay footage? Well, because we got two years, we got a lot of time. We want to start. We want to start. You know, we want to start 
the, 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 we want to start getting people excited now. And there's a lot of people excited now. Because you so, set up, you set up, you set up a found, you, you didn't just show, okay, here's a piece of hardware with a television on it. You set up a piece of hardware where you explained its approach and actually gave it a direction. So that, that's why I looked at that. I thought it was the, for these systems, the best trailer because you, you made something of it. You showed a product, not just a box with chips in it. Exactly. And that was something else that we very, very much didn't want to do what we didn't want to do. Again, we saw the mistakes that uh, that Ouya, uh, uh, sorry, uh, that the chameleon um, and and Atari uh, even has made where let's show up with a with a with a fake bo- or a, with a test unit, you know, um, let's show fake gameplay footage. Let's show we're not doing that. We're, we're, we oh, that would be this, especially with how it's much of a sour a, taste yeah. has been left in people's mouths due to all the other crap that happened, like with the Coleco Chameleon, which exactly. that was exactly. a, that was a complete mess. That would be the worst thing you could do. You'd rather show them realistic things that not oh, inflate people's expectations, and then you say, "Oh yeah, that wasn't on real hardware." You know, that would be disastrous exactly. right now. So the I mean, I could, I could show three, you know, I, I could show you three D printouts of the controllers and the system i could show it to you right now if you wanted to see it which i will for the first time ever <laughs> Woo! so i mean this is a th- okay <laughs> i, I, I don't know if you were being serious or not. okay <laughs> no i am serious yeah. this is it it's never been seen by human eyes so this is an exclusive um and and by the way and here's another one i mean there's you know there's so many different versions that we do we're literally having hundreds of different test versions it's got to feel right the curves got to feel right and here's something else if i could just say one thing uh that might blow people's mind about the about the controller people are really getting down on it because they look at something like this and they say you know oh that's the it looks like the old television controller it's so stupid i hated that thing you suck you don't know what you're doing dead on arrival blah 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 you know though there's no the stupid disc you know no d-pad you can't play old games you can't play platformers this thing sucks are you ready for me to blow your mind are you ready because you're probably gonna about to answer i was about to give you a question about the are controller. you ready are you ready i think i know what brace you're gonna yourself. do brace yourself what? Oh, <laughs> the, the, the question I have though—you're already you're already leading me to a question. It's now, the biggest D pad in the world, people. It's the biggest D pad on the planet. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. With <laughs> now the one side of that's going to be a touch screen. Now, say I have a Metroidvania platformer on the Amigo. How would that controller be responsive with that? So there's, there's, the, the great thing is, is there's many different ways. There, by the way, this is not a final anything. So people Both. are going to screen grab. Yeah, yeah. No, this is, this, is, uh, this is a 3D printout from the sketches that we had in our trailer. We mm-hmm. already have three or four more versions of this. So the reason I chose this to show you exclusively uh, is because it's the one that people have seen. We've already changed the buttons. The buttons are nothing like this. Uh, that that you saw in the sketch, um, they're 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 more, they're a lot bigger. The buttons and they go all the way down to the ends, and they're you know this and that. But um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your question now. I'm what talking, what talking um, so if I'm playing like a Metroidvania yeah, on Metroid. that? How would that work yeah. out of that? Yeah, so so basically, you know, the old television games were like this, and this this is a lot. See, you know, again, you have to understand, casual gamers. We did a lot of focus testing a lot of research and even something as simple as the atari 2600 joystick eight directions and one button you say well geez that's as simple as it gets you put that joystick into somebody else's hand who doesn't play games like my mom it's intimidating it's you know there's a big joystick she's got to grab onto it she's got to you know wiggle it back and forth very fast i don't know i i have uh you know, I you know my my, my hands hurt. I, I I don't know if I can do that. That's it's like whoa whoa. You know, um, forget a PlayStation Four dual analog sticks. Again, when we moved into 3D, that's when everything. Now you needed dual analog sticks. Now you needed shoulder buttons to strafe. Now you needed to control. You know, again, this the 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 uh, the Saturn was the last 
kind of, you know. And by the way, all those D-pads, you talk about the NES, the Super Nintendo, the Genesis, you know, they were all about the size of a quarter or smaller, a nickel. Look at this. It's the biggest D-pad in the world, folks. Um, <laughs> so, and it's going to be like that. For those of you who never played in television before, you know, that it actually tilts back and forth. It's not just like an... Uh, an iPod where it's just like you know it's a solid thing that's like a touch thing no this is an actual physical thing that's going to tilt back and forth left up and down so so you can play old television games you know like this or if you play something and I don't know if my camera is if it's reversed or not but but you can have this you know playing it with your left hand as the controller just like you would a Sega Genesis right mm -hmm. and instead of the three buttons we now have an entire screen to use for jump or fire or anything other uh, we can change this every single game we can change the screen every single time plus your index fingers are able to hit the buttons that the tactile uh, arcade style you know what i mean by that is i mean they're going to click in and out don't you hate soft buttons now yeah. i mean analog buttons are like i mean i get it analog buttons are great for you know the harder you press the faster you go i get it that's not the style of games we're going to be doing though i want to feel a click damn it like the old day i want and even the original television had those soft buttons that i that were smushy and i hated them did i press it or not i don't know you're you're gonna know every time you press one of these buttons so so you can use it like this or now i want you to flip it all the way around like this and g play a game like Space Invaders in your mind, right? So let's say your left hand, and I'm assuming that people are right-handed when I say this. Let's say your left hand is now your thumbs on the screen. So you can control your Space Invader ship left and right, or let's say Centipede. You can go up, down, left, right. Wherever your thumb goes is where the character is going to go, right? Which is much more... Be which is much uh, more accurate than a rollerball in the original centipede. You're actually going to be able to touch exactly where you go. Space Invaders, again, left, right, left, right, way better than two buttons, one button left, one button right. You're actually going to be able to go, you know, really get, you know, really um, more granular accurate movement. Yeah, exactly. But then you say, well, what about the disc? Well, the disc now becomes your fire button on centipede on uh, you know the whole thing wherever you hit it it now becomes the biggest button you've ever had on a on a on a controller so imagine playing a game like robotron in the old days robotron was on two sticks right mm -hmm. and so the stick on the left moved the character and the stick on the right moved where you were going to shoot right yeah. think of a game like earthworm jim as well where you know you you had this character that could move but when he shot all the way around he had to stop because he didn't have dual sticks he just had a joy pad and so when you shot and you pushed the button he had to stop right so imagine with something like this if you could control the character like in Robotron with your left finger on the screen, moving wherever you want on the screen, and then you use the button, the disc, to shoot 360 degree direction. Imagine what that'll feel like in your hand. Now you're cooking with gas, right? And it's simple and it's easy and it's intuitive. And again, certain games, maybe they use the shoulder buttons because when you turn it on the side, these become shoulder buttons now, like the you know, like the uh, the PlayStation buttons, uh, the trigger buttons, or whatever you know. And and again, or maybe if you want a Coleco game, you'll hold it like this, and you'll have the disc at the top. <laughs> so because of the um, because of the technology we're putting in here, it's going to be the first controller. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe. I guess well, the Nintendo Wii, you could turn it on its side, but for this. You're going to be able to turn it every single way and it's up to the designers and the developers and maybe it'll give you multiple options as well but it'll be up to them to decide on which way um you know how the control uh how the controller is made or, or how it's positioned in your hand with the playstation 4 and playstation xbox 
it, there's only one way, right? Now, with the app, you know, you, I read that you're going to have an app where people can use their mobile phones as controllers. What tech are you using to connect it? Is it going to be Wi-Fi? Is it going to be NFC? Is it going to be Bluetooth? What are you doing to do that? Because that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit. Answer is magic. No. Um, <laughs> magnetics. It's crazy. No. Um, so, so, so let me, yeah, uh, let me get into that for a second as well, too. Now, I just explained a lot of cool things that you can do with this disc, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you could use it as a D-pad. You could use it as one big fire button. You can use it in many different ways. Um, now, the controller, uh, when you use your phone and attach it to the system, you're not going to be able to have that disc, right? Mm -hmm. So, the thing that people need to understand is, you know, we can simulate this on your phone by having a graphic down there, but the reality is, for the action type games, yeah, you're going to want, a, you know, more controllers, okay? okay? What we're talking about is a game like You Don't Know Jack, let's say. And again, we're not talking to them yet. Okay, um, I, I get what you're saying, though. Yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Because I'm thinking, like, if they have even exactly. kind of some kind of so arcade shooter that, that, and, 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 and even like like even a game like tetris where you can you know sh you know quickly flick something and and it's moving on screen so so what what we want is this right now if let, let's say you have five or six friends over and let's say half of them don't play video games what are you going to do? You want to have some fun with your friends and family, or maybe it's a holiday and there's 20 people over. What do you do? Well, you know, you're going to break out Monopoly. You're going to break out uh, Pictionary or maybe Charades. And, you know, people are going to kind of, you know, maybe a card game as well. You know, let's bring out a card game or, you know, uh, something like that. It's very rare that when you have non-gamers over that you ever break out a video game system. You know, it's it's very rare. Some t back again, back in the old days when there was four controllers, you would you would put in Mario Kart. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, maybe Mario Party, but I I don't know a lot of non gamers who are like playing Mario Party every week now a days, right? And so, so the the idea of the phone being able to uh, it's going to connect Bluetooth to to the okay, system. good, good, good. Okay, okay. Yes. You already are doing and any kind so, of Wi Fi thing. No, no, it's going to be Bluetooth, um, and so up to eight physical controllers will connect to the hard to the box, okay. or or any combination of mobile cell phones and controllers. So you could have four uh, physical controllers and four, let's call them software or mobile app controllers. You could have four and four. You could have all eight of one. You could have all eight of another. You could have six mobile ones and, and two, whatever combination, but you'll have up to eight connectable devices and they'll either be an app. And so what the apps are for are this. Let's say you have four friends over and you only have two controllers. So now there's five people there and you want to play five people at a time. There'll be certain games where you'll be able to do that. Again, let's take You Don't Know Jack for an example or, or any trivia game where all you need to do is hit the Thing quick in in gaming these days and again let's take the nintendo people are like why would anyone want to buy this there's casual games on the nintendo switch there's casual games on the playstation 4 really so so i i got news for you my my dad has not played any casual games on my nintendo switch <laughs> you're right yeah. do you know any casual gamers who bought a playstation 4 so they can play casual games uh no right so that is true uh, that is true so the yes, there's casual games on there, but but that's not the reason you buy a PlayStation Four, right? And if you did, if you had five people come over your house and you all wanted to play five players at the same time on your PlayStation Four, you gotta have five controllers. <laughs> go out and buy five controllers, or what they do for multiplayer games, local multiplayer games, is you have to pass around the controller. So everybody's got to watch. Then you give person a controller, and then they play, and then everybody's watching, and then the, the you know, no, I'm talking about that. So we wanted to be able to make it very easy and free 
free. We're not charging 99 cents to download our app. We want to encourage people, come on over, download the app, connect it, and now we can all play eight-player you-don't-know Jack in tournament mode with double elimination, whatever. You know, now we're, we're bringing something to gaming that doesn't exist. And that's that's all we're trying to do. Which is an interesting way that you could actually sell the system, too, because if people who weren't even interested in a gaming console go and get the app and they're playing a game at their friend's house, it's a, it actually could be a selling point for them for them to buy it, so... Well, I got news for you. If you don't think that I'm not going to, after after that person leaves the house, now we have their cell phone. <laughs> yeah. I got news for you. When they disconnect, you know, they're going to get a pop-up that's or whatever that's going to say, hey, would you like to buy the Intellivision Amico? Here's a, you know, 20% off coupon or whatever, you know, whatever we... Oh, uh, yeah. They, it, it's a definitely you know like a, I mean? it's like a it's like free advertising and it and because you're not making exactly. them spend anything in the app it's more of an incentive too and if, and if they had fun imagine how many units we're going to sell for the casual or non-gamer who came over their friend's house they know nothing about gaming and here they are playing shuffleboard or darts or just having fun whatever it is you don't think they're going to go home and 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 want to buy it? And again, we're only talking 150, 170 bucks. We're not asking people to to invest 400 dollars with us, you know. Um, and, and and the games that price range. If I could speak about that for a second as well, because a lot of people are like, oh, I was about to ask kind? you about that. Yeah, and what, okay. two things to answer, answer: two bird, kill two birds with one stone. The um, okay. e e for e10 plus. Yes. Now I could see not going up to mature. But even not to uh -huh. include teen in there, don't you think with the pricing and only not going beyond E10 Plus, is there any kind of limitations you think that might bring to the system? I, I, I don't, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. 90% of the games that come out, 90% of all video games, and I'm including mobile and everything, 90% um, of the games are E for Everyone or E Plus 10. So I'm knocking out 10% of those games in return for a parent knowing that they never have to worry about it on our console okay. I will take that I will take that trade and here's the other thing the games that we're talking about doing I want you to name a game that you played in the 80s or on the Nintendo machine that would be considered teen even right I guess you could say, well, Symphony of the Night wouldn't have been on Super Nintendo, but uh, like, I guess you could say the Castlevania series with me. But on even, the NES. On, but, but on it, NES, no, but SNES, maybe. Right. If there was a So I'm system. talking about any, all the arcade games, you know, like all the arcade games in the 70s and 80s that we grew up on. There wasn't a single mature or teen rate, uh, again somebody's going to call me on it and say, oh, dumbass. The, don't first, the first one I thought of, the first I'm one I thought, remember mature. NARC? Remember NARC? <laughs> yeah, 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 right? But okay, yes, I get what you're saying, though. But that was the first yeah, one that so came to mind. The, 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 the overwhelming majority of games that are simple and fun and easy to play are rated E for everyone or E10. So it, 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 I, I want you to think of it like this. I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a cool story. So one of my heroes is Walt Disney, the man, Walt Disney, one of my heroes. And the Walt Disney... The way he came up with Disneyland is he took his two daughters and they would he would t always take her to a merry-go-round and he had to sit on a bench and watch his girls you know and he, and he enjoyed watching his girls but when he was on that bench one day he thought to himself you know why isn't there a place where I can go and have fun where everybody in the world can go and have fun instead of just like a merry-go-round that the kids can have i want to build a place and that's when he cre when he thought the idea of disneyland in fact if you go to the original disneyland in anaheim they have the bench that he sat on and it's sitting there right on main street you can you can you have to go to the right there where the hall of presidents are but they actually have the bench this is the bench that walt disney sat on when he came up with disneyland and so you know, he wanted a place where families can go and everybody can go to have fun. Think of the Intellivision Amico as the Disneyland for the video game industry. You're not going to find a strip joint in Disneyland, right? So we want to create a safe place 
where everybody, whether you, you know, so, so now people are going to say, well, yeah, but in Club 33, they sell alcohol. Well, yeah, but that's not open to the public, okay? So, so, so you can't use the Club 33 at Disneyland where they sell alcohol as in a, No, I'm talking about everywhere. That's an invite only Club 33. That, so that, that's you're you're kind of leading to an interesting. You know, I didn't mean to cut you off. My apologies. But now, would you speaking of like Club 33? Would you are there going to be the capability to have apps on there? Maybe like. Netflix. If you pay the parents no. want to, no, you're not going. to Okay, you're going to keep not, it compl- not, completely closed off. Okay, okay. Yes, and and the other thing that this brings up, an interesting thing too, is it brings up the multiplayer aspect. And you say, well, hold on, how can you possibly control all of the nasty things that people say online? Right. Well, that's very simple. We're taking kind of a Facebook approach to it, which is, um, uh, you know. In order for you to talk to somebody online, you have to accept, you have to know them. They have to be your friend. You have to accept them. And if, and if you okay. don't like what they're saying, you can, you know, you never have to play with them ever again. It's going to be very, very simple. And by the way, so, so what I'm saying is the default is off, meaning the default to speak to everyone is off. So it's not like, you know, PlayStation 4, you get online, everyone's on, and then you can start to, like, mute this person, mute that person, you know, be on, you know, this and that. For us, it's the opposite. It's like Facebook is. When you first get onto Facebook, you know, if you set your account to private, it's like having a private account on Facebook. That's what, you know, online gaming on our system is going to so be. So you're giving people the option to have as much privacy as they want to from the get-go, not have it be wide uh, open, and then they have to close it down. Okay, okay. Exactly, because because I want to be able my, – my brother lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. I want to be able to play in television baseball with him and give each other shit. Like, I want to be able to do that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't want to go online and have little kids or, you know, women subject, because they're a women game, female game, or be subjected to the vileness that is has become home console online gaming. I don't, I never want that to be a factor ever. So we're going to start closed and private. And then, but, but, but if me and you want to play a game, Boom, we accept each other's friends thing. Now we can talk. I, I think that's a really, you know, a smart way of approaching the whole, you know, how are we going to keep it for parents, you know, where parents feel safe and secure. Again, like I said in the press release, I'm creating a system that parents want to buy, not that they were asked to buy. Now, you're going to have 20 built-in games into the system. Did I read that correctly or am I mis- no. No, no, there's, there's going to be 20 brand new IPs available on launch. Okay, so, wow, so, you guys, you guys yeah. are 20 games, you have an exact date in 20 games, man, that's interesting, okay. Well, again, if it, if it becomes 16 because four of them suck, I, can, I can't predict the future. I, I can tell you that that's that fine. is our goal. That is, you know, that is our goal. And if it becomes 16 or 15 games, but our goal right now, two years out, is to have 20 brand new games on release and have a and and, and have you know a, a, a bunch of games that we all know and love, like Astro Smash and this and that. And we're also going to have games on the system as well. Like the system is going to come with in television first party games for free, part of the console. Um, we're looking at five to seven games right now. Um, you know, some of the big classics like Astro Smash, Night Stalker, Shark Shark, and Television Baseball. So those are the ones that, you know, we're developing internally that we want to give away from free from the get go. I don't know how many, I'm just being honest, I don't know how many there are, Uh, I don't know which games they'll be exactly, but those are the ones, you know, uh, that we're looking at and that we're, you know, starting to develop for now. And I'm seeing over here, like, uh, Bad Dudes, Caveman Ninja, which was, I forgot the American name for that, it keeps on slipping my mind what Caveman Ninja was, but uh, Toe Jam and Earl... Those are all those are all interesting ones, man. That, that's actually what part of a big part of what sold me is what you're going to be coming out with for it. I I, I got to tell you, there is stuff that I could not say in that press release that 
is going to blow people's mind because you know it, it's funny because you know the PR and marketing and the team they're always like like I always want to say as much stuff I'm so excited about this and I want to tell everybody everything and they're like Tommy you got to hold some back we got to you know we got to come out Keep with people something hyped yeah we got to come up with something epic every month. And so we had to cut out so much stuff out of that press release because there's and there's a lot in there. There's a lot that we said, but that's only like like 25 percent of what we could have said when I and, and that's the and, and for us internally, we kind of laugh when we read comments like no one's going to develop for this thing so stupid such a dumb idea you're not going to get any developers there's not going to be n any publishers no one's going to sign up what a dumb idea and we're kind of laughing to ourselves because we like we know the people we know the top publishers we know the top developers again the thing that people don't realize if you're not in the industry like making games in the industry maybe you don't see this but making games in the industry right now we're really in this strange place where there's so much content out there and it's hard to make a name for yourself. It's hard to get your product out there because there's so much crap and it's so expensive to really, you know, money equates to quality now where, you know, and, and, and a mid-level a mid -level company can't compete with Blizzard. They can't compete with the money that EA puts behind a soccer game. So your only option is not to compete with FIFA soccer, but let's come up with a 2D, super simple soccer game that people will love and more people will play because you hand, and I know FIFA has like arcade mode or whatever, dummy mode, whatever they want to call it. But but again, you put that controller in someone's hands and it and it becomes a complicated thing, right? So so yeah, that's, that's um, you know, it's, it, I can't even tell you some of this stuff, but I, 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 I'll, I'll tease it by saying this. We're going to have triple A titles on launch that are going to be exclusive for the Intellivision Amico. We are going to have some of the biggest developers in the world developing day one. So for all the naysayers and the people not in the video game industry who are saying, oh, this is stupid, no one's going to tap on this thing. Look, people in the industry, when I tell this story, and, and, and hopefully after this conversation, more people will start to really key in on it. But people in the industry, they know exactly what I'm talking about. They know exactly what I'm talking about. And they're like, we're all in. Look, you don't get the people at the end of our trailer to sign up to our company unless they know something, right? True or false? That is you know. true. That was yeah. That was a surprising part. I mean, people. It, it, there's been names touted before, but to have as many people as you had with the history that <laughs> they had. By the way, it's half of them. By the way, that's half of them because oh, wow. I had to save the other half. I have to save the other half for the end of the year announcement. You know, yeah, it's it's crazy. But I mean, we had the former president of Nintendo. You know, is, is, is in there, you know, come your break, you know, so that we have the, the, the women who launched the Wii doing our PR and marketing. Give me a break. We have the producer of Metal Gear Solid. We have the guy who came up with cloud gaming online. We have the I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Don't you think those people might know something that that the rest of you don't, you know, or whatever, you know, so they know we know where the industry is going. And it is it's sad to see so many games being made. You know, and, 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 you know, you look at VR, right? And, you know, VR is starting to go down like this. VR is starting to lose a lot of money. So all those developers who spent millions of dollars, took massive risks on investing in VR are starting to go like, how come 100 million people don't have VR headsets? What's going on? The Oculus, the Sony, the, you know, all these different things. It's like, again, it's amazing technology. But I so I, I think a lot of us saw that coming from a mile away, though. That not everyone's going to want to walk around I, with a friggin' helmet on their head. I, I I agree, and again, it's something like I I at E three this year, I, I walked past the Sony booth, and I saw the VR station, and there were people with guns with the things on their head, you know, doing this, and all I could think to myself was, oh my god, this is like Ready Player One, like the movie, like like you know, training, like. 
that's what I thought of. And again, it's a solitary experience. And by the very, way, very. that's fine. Do it. Do it. I'm not saying that's a dumb idea. People shouldn't do that. No, I want them to succeed. I want that to go. It's just not the experience that we're trying to bring. It's a completely different experience. And if anyone out there has never played with a room full of people, a video game all at the same time, if you've never done that, then I can't wait for you to play the Intellivision Amico because it's it and 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 when me and you guys who've been in the industry guys who've played games our whole life again I think that when we think back of the finest moments that we've had in gaming wasn't it when there were other people in the room playing with I don't know maybe I'm crazy no, no I, you're I, a, you're 110 yeah. percent even when I would play games like Castlevania Symphony of the Night the moments that you remember from that game or when you had your friends there with you as you were Friend. playing it oh. Oh, and they're cheering you on. Come on, yeah. let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. You know. So, but uh, yeah. So we want to bring that back. Is that such an awful thing? No, it's not. And like I said to you from the trailer, like I said, I had questions. Would you answer them all here? You're, you're showing that you have a product that has a vision behind it, and you were the first person to take a name, whether it be Atari or Intellivision or Coleco, which that was the biggest train wreck ever. And you're showing that you have something to deliver and you have a focus. And it's good to see that. And I think you will get people on board because you're actually coming with something to the table. Again, not just a box with a name on it. So I really want to... Don't, we, don't, we don't have a vision. We don't, we, not, we don't just have a vision. We have an, an IntelliVision. Oh! oh. I mean, that one, so... But, it, uh, <laughs> It's an intelligent, intelligent vision. Um, uh, one last thing, though, no I do problem. want to say about the Coleco Chameleon. Um, no, you know, please the guy do. who created that, the, the guy who committed, the guy who you know was was behind that is a guy by the name of Mike Kennedy. I I've, I've met Mike, I've met Mike Kennedy a couple of times, and I will say this. I, I I will say this about what I know of Mike Kennedy and a couple of the other people who are trying to trying to help him. I think Mike Kennedy's heart was in the right place. Mike Kennedy's a guy who loves retro gaming. I don't think Mike Kennedy sat down one day and said, I'm going to try to figure out how to screw people. I don't think he did that. I think what happened to Mike Kennedy is he, he got in way over his head and didn't understand, you know, to, to bring an actual piece of hardware to market, the amount of money it takes, the amount of people it takes, the team, the investors, the partners, the distribution, the hard. So I just think he got in way over his head. Now, that being said, the execution he didn't was to, terrible. He didn't have to, the execution was terrible. But I think when he started it, I think I think his heart was in the right place. And so it's sad to see, you know, something like that happen. I think Ouya was the same thing. You know, I think their their heart was in the same place, but the direction for that I think was completely wrong. And the fact that they they didn't launch with ten must have exclusive titles, you know, that 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 killed them out of the gate. Um and so so I will say that, but but that's the thing. A hardware company are you a real hardware company or not? Do you have electrical engineers on staff in your building? Yes or no? And, that if, you, should, and if you don't, you're screwed. I, if you don't, you're a Kickstarter project. Um, and, and so does Nintendo? Yes. Does Sony? Yes. Does Microsoft? Yes. Does Intellivision? Yes. <laughs> We have an internal staff of electrical engineers that are working on everything for us. And I'll give you another comparison. Because don't compare. Ooh, yeah. Oh, they're like, ooh, yeah. Don't compare us to that. It's, it's, it, it's insulting. And, I'll, and, I'll, and again, not that, you know. I know why you're going to say, but continue. Yeah. The ESA, the Entertainment Software Association, is another big thing. Is Nintendo in the ESA? Yes. Is Microsoft? Yes. Is Sony? Yes. Is Intellivision? Yes. Is Ouya? No. Is Atari? No. Was the Chameleon? No. This is an organization. You are sitting at the table with are you a real hardware company or not? You know? And so there you go. And really what it comes down to, and with this, the Ouya at the end of the day really was just a gutted tablet in a small box. It was just a Tegra 3 chipset. That was it. Yeah, exactly. And and the thing about our chipset and, and you know our technology for us, 
is it going to be a smoking fast 2D millions of sprites on screen? I want yes, but is that what we're leaning everything on? No, we're not. You know, we're not. When the specs, we're not about the specs of the chip and how fast shit can be done and this and that. Look, we're not going to compare to Sony. We're not going to compare to Microsoft. We're not trying to push blah, 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 blah. It's not about the hardware. It's about the experience. Now, that being said, we're also not putting a Raspberry Pi in the thing. And, and you know, so we're creating a, our own proprietary 2D chipset that is going to be smoking amazing and our own tools and so that we can create these experiences that no one else can create so anyway that's that's the sales pitch you you have you have me like i said even before we did you have me sold on it and it it's going to be an interesting product to see when it comes out and see i think if you deliver what you're saying you're going to now you may have a wider audience than you may realize so Oh, no, no. We think we're the wider audience. I just can't tell you publicly because okay. then I look like a dick. <laughs> no, that's yeah. – I'm, I'm actually I – mean, I'm looking forward to this thing, man. And especially if you could hit the lower end of that price point, I think you will – you'll be you'll be uh, selling units. So let, that, me ask you, let me ask you one question before I go. What's up? What do you think our biggest challenge is going to be? What do you think? I think you, you you explain what you're going to do with developers. I think because mm-hmm. there is I, I, there's going to be a lot of people that still just see this as Enuia. They're still going to see it as an Atari VCS because there's a very sour taste in people's mouths. You're going to have to make sure that you show them like you did with the initial trailer that, look, we're more than that. We're not just trying to sell you a name and hope to make a quick buck off of it. And the thing is, I even forgot like what you said before is you don't have a Kickstarter. Everyone else had. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. The holy shit, I didn't even think of it that you didn't you're not trying to raise money for anything. You're doing everything internal like a like Nintendo, like Sony and like Microsoft. So that's a big thing. But I think that's going to be your biggest hill to climb is oh god here's so another company I'm, I'm sorry or, or de- from a development standpoint or from a consumer uh a consumer. consumer standpoint you you gotcha. you have a good selling you your your point that you for a indie developer they may be with what you said if you if you put them in the spotlight and you say to them hey look okay fine you could go to sony they have 80 million but you're just gonna be lost in the shuffle and you still may sell only 30 copies of your game from ps playstation network you come to us we may only have in the beginning two or three million units sold but the two or three million people who are more than likely, even though you're looking to go to a casual audience for them to buy this product they're probably going to be into it they're going to pay attention to what you promote so they may go from selling a thousand units on a PS4 because no one knows it exists. They may sell five hundred thousand for an indie developer. That's a huge number on your system on the on the Amico. So that I think, you know, you may right. have a tough time with that still in the beginning. But if they, if they see that you know there there's, there's the potential to make money is there because people will know their products on there. You may get those you may get those indie developers just to make the games for your system instead of going oh, somewhere we're, else. They're, they're, they're lining up. But but to your concern, yes, yeah, so that comes out. What your concern is from the consumer standpoint is people might think it's A, B, or C. First of all, the average person has no idea what an Ouya is or a or, or a chameleon. You know, um, you know, but we have, and I can tell this, we have over ten million dollars just in marketing in the United States. So we are going to be on TV. We are going to use okay. influencers. We are going to use famous Hollywood uh, folks who I can't mention their name right now, and I wish I could, but I know the PR and marketing people would kill me. So the most famous people in the world are going to be talking about this console as wow. our spokespeople, okay. as our, you know, so, so again, make no mistake, whatever Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo have done in the past, have they advertised on TV? Yes. Did Ouya? I don't think so. Maybe they did. Um, you know, so, you know, we, again, we have the two women who launched all those consoles. I think they know how to launch a console i think they're giving us good direction as to the way we should go about marketing because they marketed the wii and the ds the ds by the way is the number one selling video game system ever 
of all time. And we have the two women who launched that in North America, and they're and and they're uh, they're on our team right now, and 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 you know helping us guide the way to what to do. Two years out, I don't, you know. So so I would say for that, you know, we got that covered because that was very important. You're absolutely right. If you know, I could have the best you know console in the world but if people don't know about it and it's not marketed the right way it doesn't matter but it's going to come down to the games and the marketing at the end of the day it doesn't matter what chip we have in it it comes down to the games and the marketing and we got that covered all right awesome i'm looking forward this is the one system where i see an old school name on that i'm actually looking forward to tommy thank you for coming on and i can't wait to see trailers and gameplay thank you you so much for having me and uh let me take so much no, not a problem. It was great to talk to you and make me learn a lot more about the system. Thank you so much. Awesome, for sure. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Hey, congratulations. If you made it to the end of the video, you should subscribe to Review Tech USA so you can hear me blabber on some more. Also, too, starting this month, I will be live streaming solely on Twitch. I'll have a link to my Twitch channel below in the description. And last but not least, make sure you click that like button. It helps out the show big time. See you guys in the next video.